majors were still pretty risk averse in investing in developing talent. Mm. Which sounds, you know, you will always hear these sounds of trumpeting, oh, we spend billions on A&R. Yes, you do. But a lot of it is in established artists or renewal of established deals. Mm. In terms of artists that are really at that sort of emerging, really low grassroots level, I think there was a funding gap. Mm. So again, you know, when I started in the world of A&R, there was no data to make a decision other than based on your ears. Right. But then you had a, there was a sort of a, uh, an understanding, there's a process of development that you needed to go through. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I am your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Today, my guest is Nick Gatfield. He has been in the music industry for decades. Um, he worked in, he was a major label executive for 25 years, uh, most recently Sony Music UK, which he left around 2014. But he has worked various majors over the years, EMI, Universal. Uh, you know, he was there when they signed Radiohead and uh, was part of Amy Winehouse's team. But he is out of the major label game now, and he has started an, an investment company, Twin is the name of the company, and uh, Twin, Twin Music, they have a, a different kind of structure of a deal, and so they invest in artists, they invest in recordings, they invest in various different artist uh, assets, if you will. And it is something that, you know, when I talk to artists and managers about their uh, what they appreciate from their major label deals when they're on a major label is they say, well, the major is kind of like our bank and they give us money, but we pretty much have to do all the work. And, you know, they keep all the ownership of everything, which really sucks. And they kind of control our lives and they tell us if we can release music. So it's not really that awesome, <laughs> especially if we come in with not not that much clout. Whereas this is a very different kind of deal. I'll let Nick explain what the structure of this kind of investment model is. He is wildly knowledgeable, top to bottom, left to right, because he's been in the music industry for so long. And he kind of breaks down how the majors used to work, how they're working now or lack thereof, what it was like, you know, in the early 2000s with Napster and just the evolution from the CD age to the digital age. Uh, or I should say from the CDH, the download to the streaming age. Um, and it's a it's a really interesting conversation. He's a very smart guy. Uh, it's clear that he he cares about uh, artists and and this new model. And uh, this is uh, one of his first artists that he signed with this deal or signed with uh, invested in is Ali X. And we had Ali X on the show not too long ago. So you can kind of go check out her episode. And it was really interesting to hear from her perspective what this deal was all about. And now from Nick's perspective as well. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ari Herstand. You can follow the show and everything we do at Ari's Take on Instagram and Twitter at Ari's Take. You can give us a like on Facebook. Visit Ari'sTake.com and sign up for that email list. If you are not on that email list, make sure you get on that email list immediately because that's where the most crucial information that I send out goes. You got to be on that email list to get notified about all of that. Please follow the show, like us, subscribe, and if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review. Those really help. If you're on YouTube and you're watching this right now, leave a comment, thumbs us up, and all right, let's kick into the show. So how is London uh, right now? Are you still fairly locked down or are things opened back up a bit? Uh, well, we were locked down and then we opened up and now we're locking down again. Uh, ah, you know, it's it, it's kind of like pretty much like everywhere else, I guess. So, uh, okay. you know, confusion reigns. Um, you know, the crazy thing is, is the, is the businesses it massively affects right now is the kind of, is the entertainment business and the leisure yeah. business. So, you know, it's really impacting things like, you know, restaurants and bars and, mm -hmm. uh, coffee shops and obviously the live music business is right. disappeared. It's gone. Yeah. So, yeah. But you know, it is what it is. It's a yeah. um, the world's a crazy place right now. So. Things are shifting so dramatically. Uh, we just had uh, Marshall Batts on the show. He used to work at Paradigm. He was one of the people who you know Paradigm let go 
pretty much every single music agent they have and pretty much dissolving their music division and so many new things are shifting and I, I mean I think there's there's gonna be a lot of really interesting companies uh, that emerge from uh, this this COVID crisis um, because you you know obviously right now we can't really do business as usual and so the people that are innovating and figuring that out on their own are the ones that are going to not just like not just thrive during this shutdown but also are going to be I think the leaders of what the new industry looks like after we emerge. Yeah, I know. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the interesting thing is, I mean, I, you know, I've got plenty of friends who who are live music agents, and mm-hmm. you know, quite a number of them have lost their jobs. But you know, you always look at that business and you go, <laughs> I say, I've got friends who worked at CAA, William Morris, and Paradigm, and you know, particularly funny in L- in LA, you go into these palaces of you know, yeah, of course, they're not always predicated on the music business, but you realize that you know. If you're an agent, you don't own anything. You know, yeah. there is, you know, you, you're there as a middleman to secure to, you know, and they serve a real purpose. But of course, sure. when you're leveraging yourself to death like that, based on mm-hmm. future live business, you've got something like mm-hmm. a pandemic comes along and your business is toast. Sure. And where it really is going to have an impact is, you know, look, festivals, Coachella's come back, Bonnaroo will come back, you know, Glastonbury, mm-hmm. they'll all come back. Yep. It's what's happened at the grassroots is where it's not going to come back in the same mm. way. But taken your point you know every so often i think there's a huge shift in business and there's innovation and smart people will innovate and there'll be a new business what do you mean that the grassroots level is not going to come back you don't think that small clubs are going to be hosting live music again oh no i think they will be but not to the extent i mean I, mm. i'm speaking primarily from the uk point of view but sure. at the moment it's, but that that business has been decimated mm. um and there's a little bit of government support but you know, I think it's all like a trickle down thing is that, you know, yes, we can look at, you know, there's, there's, if you're, if you're, well, certainly, you know, if you're Live Nation or if you're CAA or to a certain extent, or if you're a large music venue, there is a degree yeah. of government support you can get. And you probably have some cash and assets to be able to sort of ride the, you know, the ride the downturn for a period of time. Sure. But if you're a small two, 300 capacity club, um, you know, serving a sort of, you know, that, that particular music obsessive fan and they were dotted all over London. Sure. You know, those have been hammered. hammered. Mm. Uh, and I think that's the sort of, so yes, it will come back yeah. in some form, but you're not going to have the scale of that. You're not going to have a level of opportunities for some time, I don't think, as emerging artists. Sure. I, I would imagine um, that a lot of the smaller performance opportunities are going to... Um, look very differently after this. I, I don't think that there will be fewer uh, performances or le- I, I think that they just may not be in the traditional club setting. We may see more house concerts, backyard concerts, alternative yeah, yeah. style venues maybe uh, that fly under the radar don't necessarily have the liquor licenses or the same kind of licensing or, you know, and, and it may be that because, yeah, there are unfortunately, so even in L.A., so many small venues that have already gone under and yeah, yeah. are not planning to come back ever, which is it's devastating personally, you know, when things were up and running. I was I was out four or five nights a week seeing music. Um and in mostly small clubs. So yeah, that's, yeah, it, it is unfortunate what's, what it's looking like. I, right I, now. You know what? I mean, I, it's, you know, because I'm old enough, Harry, I've been around too long. Is that, you know, I still <laughs> find me the, you know, my current business, I mean, you know, thank God it's, it's, yeah. it's fine because we, you know, we have, you know, we have, you know, IP and music assets and they stream right. and stream, you know, streaming is, is largely immune to kind of any kind of, you know, it's largely immune to a pandemic, but you know, mm-hmm. it, 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 not completely immune, but largely immune. Sure. Um, but having said that, you know, I still think, you know, uh, an artist being able to learn their craft and and have that level of close audience engagement, and you're going to only learn that from playing in front of an audience. And admittedly, right. yes, you're right. That house by the various, there's loads of other ways of doing it, but sure. I think it's critical in terms of people building a sustainable fan base and a career. You know, you can have a streaming hit and nobody knows who you are. Right, um, the, which we know, the see all the time. That, I mean, because we, of playlists. We see all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think mm-hmm. the only way you'll go, and streaming is largely a passive lean back experience, but the only way that 
you know, we focus on that really heavily is, is artist engagement. It's, you know, mm-hmm. streaming is a wonderful thing because it's, you know, it's, 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 it's taken all barriers to releasing music down, but there's sure. no, it, it, it doesn't substitute for your proper fan engagement. Even the engagement you have online, you know, we always used to do, you know, we still got willing, we'll bring it back. Where if we're working with a developing artist, mm-hmm. you know, we'll put on a live date it may be six months down the line, but keep pointing people to that because that, that's the point. I always go, the primary engagement is someone to get off the couch and buy a ticket mm. and go and see a show. That's where you sure. know you've actually reached someone. It's, it's much easier than going like or follow. It's, no, it's, really, it's much tougher to get to it. Right. I always say that uh, you know followers want to be entertained for free and fans support you financially. And Correct. we are in this follower age where it's so easy to just click follow on any of the platforms, but right, buying a ticket, get it off your ass, get into the show. That's a huge level of investment, not just with the money, but I mean, you're, you're scheduling your entire day or evening yeah, yeah. around it, your friends, all of that. So that's interesting. So you mentioned ownership earlier and equity. Um, you know, you come from the major label world, which that's how labels, uh, that's how they operate. They are based on ownership. On, on owning these assets. Now you left uh, Sony UK, was it 2014 or so, yeah. 2015? 2014. 14. And now you're uh, investing in artists in a really interesting, um, innovative way. Uh, can you just explain kind of what uh, Twin Music is and, and you know how you got into uh, this new investment model and, and just what it looks like? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, as you said, I mean, I, you know, I, I hate to admit it, but I've been a, I was a sort of a 25 year plus major label executive. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a, a kind of obviously seeing huge changes in the business. You know, when I started in the business, it was in the sort of towards the mid to late eighties. And, you know, someone who's made the coin phrase say it was almost impossible to lose money in the eighties and nineties. <laughs> and then almost impossible to make money in the two thousands. And that was obviously, <laughs> the app of the Napster and what happened to the business. Sure. And again, you know, I started it, uh, I started as an A&R guy at EMI in the late mm-hmm. 80s. And in all seriousness, I didn't know what a budget was. There was just, and then the CD revolution in terms of just renewing the capital with so much mm-hmm. money washing around the business. Sure. And then come Napster, the business got incredibly risk averse in terms of the mm-hmm. way it invested and became much more data centric. Over the years, it became much more data centric. And I think that's mm-hmm. the, you know, that was kind of the, you know, it's the way of the world and it's absolutely a huge part of the business. Mm-hmm. But prior to going to EMI, and I always look at this as sort of, a kind of a, a really interesting learning curve for me. You know, I'd always been in a very traditional business. So I went from EMI to Polygram in the States to Universe back in the UK. Mm-hmm. And then I was hired by EMI by when Terra Firm acquired EMI, which is a bank. Um, they acquired EMI in a sort of very kind of controversial deal. Mm-hmm. And I was hired to run new music in North America and the UK which on paper sounded like it was just a dream job. It's like the two major records on market, amazing. You know, in practice, it was a nightmare, and largely because Terra Firma sort of found out that when we really started putting all the numbers together is, holy shit, it's the catalog that makes money, and new music just hemorrhages money. Uh. Um, um, <laughs> but we're also still at that time when you kind of realize that actually you need, you know, obviously you need new releases, you need new music and currency, A, because it builds your catalog, and B, it's the only way you're going to leverage a catalog in the stores. Anyway, kind of a long story mm-hmm. short, the trials and tribulations of EMI around that period is sort of fairly well documented, but it was constantly mm-hmm. in fear of being broken up and sold. And of course, it ultimately was sold. Sure. But it was a very interesting exercise in the world of A&R because no artists, no, no right thinking artists, or certainly an artist who had any degree of major buzz about them would sign to EMI. No lawyer would let them sign to EMI because he's just going to be crazy. The company's going to fold any minute. Right. And it was a very interesting exercise because it forced us to do deals which nobody else would do or forced us to be creative in terms of the deals mm. that we did. Interesting. So, you know, the first kind of real deal where we looked at something very different was with Dead Mouse, where we did a straight JV for five years as a fixed term to create a joint venture company, Dead Mouse Inc., which EMI had 50%, Dead Mouse had 50%, and it was for mm. all encompassing live merchandise recorded music. It was a 360 deal. It was a 360 deal, but a very different kind of, as I said, there was like after five years, the deal was done. But it was 50 50, where it wasn't, it wasn't like the 85 15 oh. split to the label, that kind of a deal. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Across cool. the board. And I'll tell you what, sure. what was incredibly interesting about that was actually 
Uh, I don't know, so we did a very similar deal with Swedish House Mafia on the back of it, very similar type of deal structures. Mm. And what that was, when you sit around the table, you were stakeholders in the same business and you had the same agenda. So Dead Mouse always look at an interesting example because when we did the deal, and it was quite lucrative at the time because it was just starting to feel the buzz, but it was, a, it was a live buzz. It wasn't a recorded music buzz. Sure. Um, and, but we took a decision really not to commercialize his music uh, at that point. We took the decision collectively because it, the underground was embracing it so much. The ticket sales mm. were growing. You know, he had so many kind of top line artists definitely wanting a Dead Mouse track. Mm-hmm. And we took the view that, you know what? Let's keep it, let's keep it underground. Let's keep it grassroots. Let's keep the ground sort of going as it is. Now that's a conversation I would have never had with an mm-hmm. artist under the traditional deal, because obviously your sure. job is, where's the hit? That, right. was, the, that, <laughs> right. that was the job. Huh. And this was about, okay, here's your business. And how do we grow the business? And the best way of growing it was actually always giving the music away, focusing on the live side. His merchandise started doing really well. And we grew the brand. Anyway, the recordings the were kind of the lost leader. Yeah, kind of. Well, and then the recordings themselves became successful, but they were, sure. you know, if you look at the pecking order of income, it was live yep. by far. The, right. uh, you know, we, right. we culminated the end of that deal with three nights at Madison Square Garden. It worked nicely. Wow. Yeah. But I, but I think that, but the, the point was, A, it was a, it was a really equitable, healthy relationship where you were trying to mm. do the same thing and you had the same kind of agenda. Um, interesting enough, uh, it was after my time, but uh, the deal was renewed. Uh, so mm. even after five years, the deal, it stayed in place. And anyway, it was kind of a, and then sort of EMI, unfortunately, didn't make the cuts because of various financing issues. And I sure. went, uh, I went in Sony and mm-hmm. uh, I quite honestly tried to introduce some of those deal structures into, a, into, uh, into that company and found it very difficult. Mm. still very much built on. I mean, it's, you know, you know Sony's a great company, uh, has a great catalog. Um, it was, but it really, it really operated on its old legacy model. It's it, sure. frankly, the same as pretty much what universal mourners are doing as well. Mm-hmm. And I came out of thinking, okay, well, there's two issues. One, we need to change the paradigm and the way that we work with artists. And the other thing is majors were still pretty risk averse in investing in developing talent. Mm. Which sounds, you know, you'll hear, always hear these sounds of trumpeting. Oh, we spend billions on A and R. Yes, you do, but a lot of it is in established artists or renewal of established deals. Mm. In terms of artists that are really at that sort of emerging, really low grassroots level, I think there was a funding gap. Mm. So again, you know, when I started in the world of A and R, there was no data to make a decision other than based on your ears. Right. But then you had a, there was a sort of a, uh, an understanding, there's a process of development that you needed to go through to, mm-hmm. to find out what was there. Maybe that was a one or two album cycle. So anyway, so, you know, to be fair, I left Sony and, and dicked around for a while and, you know, investing in technology. I always had this thing in the back of my mind. And um, <laughs> I, know you, uh, I know you interviewed Ali, who, um, yeah. who is Ali. Ali was my, Ali my first... Ali, Ali X was my, my first investment. And Ali and I spoke about management. I was kind of, I don't want to do management. I'm not, you know, management is just a pain in the ass gig. How did you uh, guys meet? How did you know each other? It'd be really, really bizarre. So the, the, the last one of the guys uh, at Sony uh, bought in Catch, which is our first thing in Catch. And we both like freaked out, loved Catch. And then I heard a few more tracks and we flew Ali over with her management at the time mm-hmm. and we had dinner and we got on great and, anyway, and a couple of weeks before, i literally left sony like the week later oh, wow. and okay. kind of, such is life so we didn't uh, and then i, I do remember her talking about, i don't know if you listened to the episode but she did mention how you guys really hit it off and she was so excited about sony because of you and then you left a week later and she's like wait a minute <laughs> well yeah I'm, I know. Like, I'm supposed to sign this deal now my guy yeah. he left right <laughs> and, then, and now she's stuck with me <laughs> right. um, no, but, you know, but there is, you know, therein lies the fate of so many artists at major labels. You know, it's, you know, you, right. you cannot, don't just, as I said, I've had many friends of the business, but you can't guarantee that someone's going to be there forever. Right. Um, but we just started talking after, you know, maybe six months to a year after I left. And um, again, I had this kind of plan about, you know what, and it, without overcomplicating the issue, the UK is actually a very, very healthy place to invest in real emerging startups because there's very mm. good 
there's very good tax breaks and very good government incentives. So I thought, well, listen, nice. artists, are, artists are our own startup business. You know, AliEx is the CEO of AliEx Inc. Right. Um, and like every startup company, they need some seed investment and they need some mentorship. Mm. Mm. Um, and so that's how we started. And I thought, okay, I firmly believe that from Twin, my company, we can grow a catalog uh, from the ground up as opposed to the top down where most people acquire catalogs by making what we hope smart investments and then working with the artists to, you know, put them a, a step or two up on the ladder. Um, mm-hmm. That's the hard thing, obviously, in business now. I mean, this is four years ago. And I mean, sure. the crazy thing, if I look at how Spotify particularly has grown at that time, I mean, four years ago, I think Spotify was taking like 10,000 tracks a day. It's now forty five to 50,000 a day. Mm-hmm. But it was really helping them say, okay, what you don't want to do as a developing artist is major labels absolutely serve a purpose. You know, if, if you've got a spark, they're great at throwing gas on that spark and creating a fire, but they're not great at creating the spark. That's mm-hmm. down to you guys. Mm-hmm. And unless you've got somebody who's got some connections or a little bit of cash to help you do that, that's incredibly tough. That's just, you know, good luck. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's how we started. It was the idea of short term angel investment into artist businesses. Mm-hmm. And we'd invest in a, in a bundle of rights. Um, you know, in Ali's case, it was the, where we, we, we picked up collection one and invested in collection two. And then we just carried on on a, on a kind of you know mutually agreeable basis. Is it just on the recording side or is it on the whole career? So you're investing in AliX Inc. as a as an investor would traditionally invest in a startup. Uh yeah. How does that look? Well, it's it's on Ali, on Ali is a is a little nominally, it's the mostly on the recording side. So, you know, we do have a share of live and we do have a small share in publishing rights, but primarily it's recorded music. Publishing you already had a deal, was in a place there. Sure. Um, but every other deal that we've done since is basically is a 360, but they're all short term. So, you know, they're all like, okay, we're going to do maximum initially the first album mm. and we will have an option, but it's a mutual option. So we both want to stay in business together. Okay. And the job for me is like, look, if we, st- if we do a great job, you'll stay in business because it's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, a, it's, I think is a fairer structure. And it's very much a team. It's what I kind of experienced with the dead mouse thing. It's like, look, we're trying to do the same thing. I'm not trying to tie you down for 12 years of your career and own your repertoire for life. You know? Explain how this this model works a little bit, because in, in you know, quote unquote, traditional investing, kind of like in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, the investor invests a certain amount of money. I, we, we've watched Shark Tank, you know, you're going you're to put in like, you know, I'm going to put in a uh, uh, million dollars for 20% of the business. And that means you're, you know, you're getting 20%. Um, and that the valuation is, you know, the up there. So, uh, but, but they stay an investor until you either go public, cash out your shares or whatever, or, or you get sold and yeah. you know what is the exit strategy with this so after if this is just on a a term like a or a, an album cycle kind of like the traditional record label deal yeah. is it similar to how record labels operate whereas the term can end and then you just part ways or is the artist kind of on the hook i don't know if on the hook but it uh do you make your investment back or how does that work kind of break oh, it down I mean, the distinctions no, it, 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 yeah it, well the, the very simply is is as i say we make an investment over a bundle of rights you know so we will retain mm-hmm. an interest in those bundle of rights regardless okay. of when the term ends but the point gotcha. being is it's a it's a bundle of rights as opposed to seven five seven you know time in memorial in perpetuity in perpetuity, in perpetuity or term you know term plus 15 or whatever the deal is yeah i try okay. to get in perpetuity um right, right. you know that's it's, it's kind of it's my pension mary um sure. of course but yeah but i and again it could be as short as five tracks five masters or it could be in as in Ali's case because on the mutual basis it works well together you know the interesting thing with the you know, the relationship we have and with a couple of other artists now which has extended the term is uh you know, really is we're business partners with you. At the mm-hmm. end of the day, we look at opportunities to maximize that. You know, I, I think the number one thing that we try and provide artists is, is a sustainable income. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even if we end up doing, we've done five tracks together or six tracks together, but you build a fan base, you know, who you have a relationship with, 
We've created a merchandise structure for you so you can start, you know, you can start really capitalizing your business. Mm-hmm. Um, beyond those assets, the, the, the intellectual property, we're done. As soon as the deal's over, we move on. That's, uh, so our, our, you know, our equity is retention of the catalog that we've invested in. What do you, uh, sure, sure, that makes sense. Um, now, with a, a label, you know, labels can promise um, the weight of the company and the team and their connections. Um, do you have, uh, is, is this, are you just putting up the money and kind of your personal connections or is there more of a, um, a team or a structure that helps out in that case? Or do you yeah. then are you expecting the artists to kind of come in with management and their own team and that kind of stuff? No, 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 we are, I mean, it's again, it's fairly bespoke. There is a team, sure. it's not just me. Um, I mean, it's a small team, but I mean, our primary focus is on, you know, is A&R, which is, you know, I will do uh, alongside the artists and it's, and, and we call it engagement. So it's obviously we're making sure it's digital marketing, for want of a better phrase. So it's really sure. working on across all social media platforms, uh, working with, closely with DSPs, working closely with YouTube, ensuring all the channels to reach an audience they're fully engaged with and helping the artist develop that connection with the audience. And that's what we invest against primarily. Gotcha. So are you kind of patchworking these quote unquote label services together, meaning you'll like hire a, a, a digital marketing agency that specializes in this and then you'll hire the um, you know, a, well, you'll work with a distributor that has the connections with the DSPs and then you invest. So you're basically patchworking all these services yeah. together because it's possible to do these days. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, pr- pretty much, yes. That, that's okay. what it is. As I said, we have in-house digital marketing, but, you know, for instance, if we are, you know, if we're doing a TikTok campaign, for example, there are specialists sure. who do that better than we do. So that's where we will invest and bring them into the mix. Gotcha. You know, I still think this business largely runs on personal relationships though so for instance you know mm-hmm. we will always uh you know we have uh, we have people on the ground in la working closely with the dsps there mm-hmm. we have relationships with spotify and apple so in the uk and the us and so mm-hmm. it's, it, you need to have alongside your distribution part you need to be able to have the phone and be able to pick up the phone and have those conversations directly are you got the keys to it for <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, do you have a distribution partner who you use for all of your artists, or is that kind of up to each artist's particular situation? No, we have a we have a long term arrangement with AWOL. AWOL, okay. Uh, yeah, cool. um, and our publishing company is with AWOL as well, so they administer Cobalt, our publishing sure. business. Yeah, Cobalt, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think. It's an interesting thing. Is I think I think there is a, there is I think they're they're a really interesting smart company. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Willard, the founder of the company, seized an opportunity way before a lot of other people and saw you know just read where this business was going, yep. and believe that you know what the uh, the growth of independence well it's the fastest growing segment of the music business now is self release. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. initially it's grown from a small base, but you can see kind of where the where the the, the process is going. Sure. Um, you know, I think where all these companies have got to be careful is, is there's just a sheer volume of music that goes out there. It's just yeah. a tsunami of stuff. Yeah, I mean, AWOL us. ran, yeah, AWOL ran into that issue uh, a couple of years ago when they opened the floodgates and they started taking on way too many artists that they could handle. And they'll be the first to admit this. I've sat down with them and talked to them about it, yeah. but they couldn't keep up with the support needs and the administrative needs. And honestly, just like the personal touch that they were uh they kind of made their name as doing as as kind of having those account reps Mm -hmm. on your team and that kind of stuff and so they've you know they've shifted their model a little bit um since then but yes willard the ceo has has been and the founder has been you know very forward thinking about um just taking the percentage of the royalties and not owning anything and not getting into the ownership model and just kind of taking a small percentage whether as you know AWOL will take 15% whereas labels traditionally majors would take 85% it was like they flipped it on its head and then cobalt similarly um 
not owning the publishing, but just supporting those uh, and and help ex- helping exploit those compositions uh, for their songwriters and producers without taking that ownership, which was, I mean, it's one of the reasons that they they their catalog became so valuable. Why so many songwriters left their traditional uh, major publishing deals and went over to Cobalt, and similarly with artists now, uh, you know, using services like AWOL or the other independent distributors out there as well. It's 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 very interesting. So yeah. you're, you're um, you know, I, I'm curious because the more artists that I talk to and, and managers uh, who traditionally have worked with major labels or still do or are on a major or something like that, I'm like, I always ask them, I was like, like, what do you get the most from the majors? Like, what are they giving to you? Why do you, why are you with them? Or why is that attractive to you? What do you get from the majors and how much work are they doing? And how much work are you doing? Across the board, everyone is like, well, the major is the bank for us. And basically, they give us money, but we pretty much do everything. And, you know, yeah, if they have a radio department, you know, it's it's like radio and it's the bank. And, like, we kind of rely on them, but we're pretty much doing 95% of the work. And so that's why I'm, like, so interested in, in your model because it's not as um, – I don't know if cumbersome is the right word um, – as a, as a major um, – where you have all these these hands trying to you know get into the pot here and, and try to navigate and and um, try to shift things around and there's a lot of egos flying everywhere and, and whatnot. Whereas like you're the bank, just like like labels are the bank, but you also because of your history you have the connections because that's the other thing that labels can provide. They can provide those connections, and so um, I'm I'm interested in is this a model that you think can scale. Uh, and are you in like are you planning to scale it internally or is this kind of a wave of this new model that just other people you you're going to start to see more frequently um yeah that's a good question i mean look i mean i i i you know i kind of concur with that yes i mean if you ask me what's uh and it's a little harsh but yes you know <laughs> you use a major as i said majors are accellerants you know what sure. but i and i think and this applies to you know mostly in my career through majors you know the problem with a major label the major label structure right now these are big machines and you know you need to fuel that machine to keep it operating um you know, plus, and I sort of describe it in certain circumstances. You know, I've had an artist on there who, quite recently, actually, we recently, who was signed on a really healthy deal to uh, to Universal, and stayed there for eighteen months. Didn't put anything out. Was dropped. Mm-hmm. Now, trust me, we were delighted that that actually happened. But we were delighted because she had a team, and there was there was a lot of activity going on. And actually, it was in other parts of the world where she was very active. But, you know, if she didn't have that team, and, you know, there was other activity going on around the rest of it, it's a career killer because you can't mm. put music out. That's the problem. There's no fluidity. That's the biggest problem with it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, what I've always tried to build in when I just go talk about anything, if we do upstream into a major and we're still involved is we have a degree of autonomy in terms of how mm. we take music out. Not because of some, you know, we can do it better than you, but we can be faster and nimbler and we can react quicker. And that's still... You know, one of my things again, you know, I fundamentally believe is you look, you look at the major label actually, and a lot of people go, you know, the catalogs have always been the things have been the sort of the the engine room of a major. You know, there's, sure. if they're profitable, the high margin, uh, you know, the the the, the, the artists available, the A and R side of it is a high risk business. Mm-hmm. And I always looked at labels. What labels should be are, are incubation centers. That's what they should be. They should, they should purely focus on the type of deals that we do, short term, mm. and build relationships with the artist. And you know what? You'll stay in business if you do a good job. And if you don't do a shitty job, you won't stay in business. Sure. Um, again, that's a kind of the whole idea of not having ownership of repertoire is a real anathema to the majors because that's the legacy model that it's been built on. But right. it's just the way of the world. You're shifting from a rights ownership model to a service model mm-hmm. and it's and it's really hard for, for you know for and i understand it to get their heads around that and that's that's a fundamental shift so i think it's fascinating you know if you could be bothered to actually look at various banks analysts uh, sort of view of the music industry particularly if they happen to be representing universal in the flotation it's like oh my god you know the beginning of this this huge gold rush and it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger 
And yeah, I believe in the terms that the streaming is still at the relative tip of the iceberg. As streaming's got a long way to go, albeit maybe more in developing markets, but you've still got a hell of a long way to go. Sure. But I think the difference is now is the balance of power has shifted away from labels, certainly towards artists and definitely towards DSPs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's that whole disintermediation going on between major label and artists and, and you know, it, and it's unfortunately the history of major labels. And I can right. say this with experience is that, you know, we hand the keys to other people to build a brilliant business off. You know, it was MTV in the eighties and it was iTunes right. in the noughties and now it was Spotify. And you kind of go, Oh shit, how did that happen? But you know, right. Right. So I, and I kind of don't think there's any, any turning back from that. So, mm. you know, and I think that's incredibly exciting because you know, I look in my, in our, in our small way, you know, you'd love to believe this was a sort of birth of a whole new generation of independent labels, not done in the way it was done in the 60s, which was kind of daylight robbery, but real sort of maverick A&R people like Chris Blackwell and, you know, you know even Geffen, people, and people who started those kind of music passion imprints and were able sure. to move really quickly. And I think mm-hmm. that's, I think that will happen and is happening as well. And do you, th- yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, do you think that uh, major labels uh, will always have their place in the industry as kind of the major driving forces of popular culture? Or do you already see that shift away from the majors and their, market share will continue to d- diminish. Well, uh, you know, I don't think, I don't think majors, any label has been a driving force of popular culture since death row, probably. Um, okay. I seriously, I mean, I mean, the way I look at it is, is they've got to figure out their role. I, I kind of look at where the majors are going right now, what is, is kind of where the movie industry is. Mm. And you go, and I'll use Sony pictures as an example, not because it's just so much, just Sony pictures. You go, right. Sure. Sony Pictures are very good at making franchise movies. They're great at that uh, the Marvels. Spider-Man, Marvels, or right, whatever right, it right. happens to be. You know, they can sure. knock them out of the park. They understand the international market. They understand mm-hmm. how to blow this thing up, and they can put a hundred million dollar marketing budget behind it and make an event out of it. Yes. What they're not good at is is discovering the next franchise. You know, the uh-huh. next one, and they're not good at discovering the, you know. Or you name whatever movie, you know, that, uh, that's, you know, uh, Parasite. You know, they're not good at that sure. kind of business. Those invariably come from independent producers, you know, who scraped around to try and get enough money to make it. And then they find somebody who's prepared to back it. And, it's got, it, it, and I think that's where the music business is. So you'll have mm. the likes of Universal will be on major, you know, Taylor Swift has, has committed herself, albeit on a very different turn to Universal for a long period of time. Adele has committed herself to Sony for a long period of time, albeit mm-hmm. on a much more equitable basis, but they will serve a purpose. You want a global knocking out the park day one type of traditional type of, you know, pull this, pull this string back as far as it can go and release. Yeah. They'll serve that purpose. Of the art, when you were at uh, Sony, um, what percentage uh, would you say of the artists that you signed every year um, s- kind of stuck with the label and uh, recouped, I guess, the advance um, on their first album? Cool. Wow. Uh, well, we always <laughs> used to pretend. I mean, there always used to be a figure that goes it's one in 10, which is probably not. Mm-hmm. It's probably like more like one in 15. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I did the grisly exercise. If, if you really are, if you're really brutal about, and we did this, as I was saying in, in EMI, you'd like, so I was charged with running new music. New music was anything which is on the current roster, making music. Once that album had dropped 18 months after it dropped, it became catalog. So you really mm. had a very small window. <laughs> and it was an exercise in trying to break even. That was sure. basically what it was. Mm. Um, but then, you know, one of the things that kind of I now look at it particularly is, you know, when you it's, it's it's very, you know, if you're lucky enough, and you know, trust me, I have to do some speculating. Is you know, I think everybody should sort of invest in themselves at some point if you're going to go into the music business. It doesn't necessarily stick your hand into your own pocket, but you know, you became in the major, you sort of become oblivious to budgets in a in a funny okay. kind of way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, less so now, but certainly a few years ago. 
And I remember when, you know, when Terra Firma, as I say, was a bank acquired EMI. <laughs> and I remember them saying to me, going, oh, well, you know, we have an investment committee. And I was like, what, what the hell is an investment committee? I said, well, you know, you want to spend a million dollars on an act, you bring it to the investment committee, which is made up of sort of analysts and bankers. And I go, this is it's crazy, it's nuts. <laughs> Uh, I, funny enough, I remember that, and I, took, I had to take Dead Mouse to the investment committee, and you know, wow. he's funny. About, he's a guy. He wears this giant mouse head, and, <laughs> right. and yeah, it's definitely worth a million of your dollars. Right, right. Um, but I mean, but in all seriousness, I mean, I kind of looked at it and go, I kind of get their point because how did you make those decisions before? And largely, it was a bunch of, I have to say, mostly you know, forty-something male white executives sitting in a room going, "I don't know. I feel pretty good about this." And you'd right. make the investment case based on you just wanted to do the deal, so you make mm-hmm. any old number up. Mm-hmm. And there was kind of no real, I, I don't know. I mean, there was a it's, and there still is a vast amount of wastage in that business in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there are warehouses littered with the reels of, you know, $50,000 videos that never got seen in the light of day or scrap. <laughs> I mean, it just goes on and on and on and sure. on. And that's just the nature of the business. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think largely the, the point is, is that, you know, the majors now have to be far more savvy about how mm. they invest the money. And I think it's going to get tougher still because, you know, when, when all of a sudden when Universal gets other shareholders involved, I use Universal as a, as a and I think Universal is, is out of all majors by far the most forward thinking. And they mm. kind of have the scale to, you know, and they have the A&R chops as well to kind of, you know, keep growing their market share. But there's still a staggering amount of waste that goes on and duplication. I mean, you think of Universal alone in the States, you've got Capital Records, you've got Universal Public, you've got Interscope, Geffen A&M, mm-hmm. and on it goes. And they've all largely do the same thing. They've all got mm-hmm. full promotion staff. So they largely, you know, they'll compete for artists. It was set up that, you know, it was a competitive structure inside the company and that sure. was quite healthy. But, mm-hmm. you know, is it really necessary to have four full-blown national radio teams right now when radio is kind of, you know, radio is not the driver anymore. Right, right. Anyway, it's... Um, <laughs> Well, that's I could pull your listeners around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. That that's super interesting. And but uh, you know, you mentioned that you had a eighteen month window, basically, and after eighteen months, it was a legacy uh, or catalog. A part of, became part of catalog. So it, that's a very short window to develop uh, a, a, an artist or a song. It's funny because you know I was listening to the head of um, data at Chartmetric. And for people that don't know what Chartmetric is, uh, that it is a it's a it's a startup in Silicon Valley that basically takes Spotify and TikTok now uh, and and a few other platforms and YouTube their API publicly available data information on the back end or open to anyone but developers primarily, and they ingest it and they put it in a beautiful interface so you can search basically you know an artist and see every single playlist editorial or user generated every single playlist they're on and then look at all the stats and they put together beautiful graphs all that stuff anyway they have a ton of data and they're analyzing all of this stuff in real time and what he mentioned was that the um um it's not about week one anymore it's about week 151 (laughs) and so when you think about it like that you're like wow it's it really has turned the release strategy on its head and that it's really not about you know coming out with such a bang and it's really like how are you going to sustain and build that career but i almost feel like the majors haven't really caught up yet or aren't structured for that and so like if you're going to determine not you but like if a major is going to determine within 18 months if something is a success or a failure and whether they're going to drop that artist and and oftentimes it's even quicker than that uh much sooner than that it's it's kind of there it's it's not that development that is really necessary at kind of building the career or growing and it's still that like how do we get that hit chasing the hits well yeah i, I think you i think you make a great point i mean actually funny enough i mean Talk about Ali X. I mean, you know, it, it, she's built an incredibly loyal fan base, and her streaming numbers are are excellent. But her biggest contract came out in 2015. It just, you know, there are certain things that you know, TikTok was a primary driver of that. But there are certain things that kind of, 
a trigger point, you know, it might be a sync or whatever it is. So, I mean, that is, and again, that is the beauty of streaming, which is, you know, nothing's ever out of stock. It's always there. It's always available. Mm-hmm. But you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I mean, again, when I say 18 months when it became cattle, that was just a kind of a, a financial mechanic, but largely it was 18 months of release. It shifted into the cattle. It didn't mean you dropped the artist, but it's kind okay. of, that was a kind of the, but you stopped working it, it basically. You kind of stopped working it. It kind of yeah. done, but but that's a funny, you may get, funny, I had this conversation with someone in the university the other day, actually, and they were taking a shorter time frame. He's actually going, you know what? We only really look at something three months in, you know, wow. only, certainly on the new development. We only really look at whether it's going to, unless you have this kind of rare moment. Mm-hmm. Um, that's also changed the paradigm enormously because I mm-hmm. kind of look at those things where, you know, previous releases, you have the kind of impact marketing. So, you know, mm-hmm. you'd have a two single album campaign and it'd like be bang and you hit it hard and you hit it hard mm-hmm. again in a second and then you hit the album hard. And then you had a slow tail, which actually dropped off pretty rapidly. Very hard mm-hmm. to keep sustaining that. Mm-hmm. And now, and I kind of reuse this phrase, we, you kind of always got to be on. Doesn't mean you're always throwing money at stuff, but you've got to subtly tweak constantly what you're mm-hmm. doing. And you've got to be smart about how you're using that marketing fund to really start, you know, you can't force attention. That's the, that's the great thing. You can't sure. ram it down anybody's throat anymore. They have to yep. discover it, embrace it. You just have to kind of slowly nurture it and put it into the right areas where it can be discovered. But, you know, mm-hmm. I, I just don't think there's any, I describe it, there's no push anymore. It all has to mm. be pull. Mm. Uh, I, I, and that is a that, that is a fundamental difference of the way that pulled that by changed. the fans. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But yeah, and they say it's a change of behavior the way that uh, the majors have to work. And again, I think as a large thing is is you know I obviously I'm I'm an evangelist for the way that we work, which is sure. look, if you're investing in an artist proposition, you know, as a as a business partner and mm-hmm. you do the right thing by that artist, then you stay the course and you're on the journey mm-hmm. you, and you realize it's a, you know, it's a, it can be a three, four, five year journey before you mm-hmm. see the results of that, you know, the, the fruits of your labor. So break it down for the uh, potential investors who are listening to this or the artists who, ha- who are close to people who are want to invest in music, but this model isn't necessarily as widely um, uh, um, adopted yet, uh, how this works. I mean, you say you kind of invest in certain things, but but is it in a way where um, you're going to uh, like, where is the, where is the, is there an exit? Where's the money actually coming in? Is the investor getting like dividends or whatnot? Or, or how does that, how does it work in terms of, I'm going to put up, okay, I have, you know, um, I want to invest in, in music. I have a million dollars. I love this artist. What is that like? How does that look? What does that work? Well, we don't do that in terms of an individual artist. So, we're, so in fact, and, and all the investment, I should say, right now has come from me to date. Okay. So, or well, no, that's not strictly true, actually. So when we first started, we actually, and I was, I was telling you about the sort of favorable investment climate in the UK. So there are a couple sure. of vehicles which we continue to use, which give very favorable tax breaks on certain types of businesses, this being one of them, because it's cool. considered to be highly high risk, high speculative, but you can only raise, you know, $200,000 for that. Okay. So we have done a fund around that where we go to look. So that is what we call a master. It's a master investment deal. Okay. So you as a third party investor, you will invest in your money will go to invest in a bundle of masters. Gotcha. Whoever the artist is, is kind of irrelevant. That's what you trust us to do that. We pick the okay. right artist. Gotcha. Uh, we use those, we use those funds to platform the artists whilst building, building a catalog. And mm. that catalog might be, three tracks at a time by one artist and then they go off or we might extend into a long-term relationship like we have with Ali and a few other, a few other projects. Okay. Um, interesting you talk about scaling because it's exactly what we've been discussing in the last couple of months. Um, that the idea of having what we call us, we're a really sort of an incubation center. Um, you know, we have more product coming to us, more artists coming to us than we can possibly handle. Sure. And we have them coming from all over the world, which is kind of interesting. Um, and we are in quite close discussions about setting up a very similar type of structure that we have in London, in Los Angeles. 
Um, but also the idea of creating these incubation hubs in key repertoire centers, which mm. operate kind of autonomously, but also provide a support structure for each other as well. So, you know, Twin London signs an axe, Twin LA will be able to support that artist in that particular market and vice okay. versa. It's kind of, it's kind of what the major labels do to a certain right. extent, although, you know, another myth to be exploded. I always say, you know, I spent 30 <laughs> years of my life saying, you've got to sign a worldwide deal with one company. It's confusing otherwise. And I spend my life saying, do never sign a worldwide deal with a company. <laughs> you know, make sure yeah. they care. You know, that's the most, right, uh, right. most important thing. So with the, um, okay, so what can an investor, so let's say I'm one of those investors that is putting up 50K or something like that for a batch of masters that you're, you know, I don't know the artist. I don't know. I'm just, I trust you. You're like my yeah. stockbroker. Uh, you know, what What can I expect? When do I get a return? What well, most of these like? funds though, so most of these funds are going to UK operate, they kind of mature after around four years. Okay. So you kind of say, okay, I mean, for min a minimum of three, but mostly four years. Um, if you hold your investment into these funds for four years, you pay no capital gains tax. So they're very, very, very efficient. Now, there are kind of, I mean, it's very UK, but there are similar things that happen in the States as well like sure. that, with this type of thing. And then at the end of that time, assuming that fund has been successful, you either receive a dividend payment from the fund based on you no know, streaming numbers and you know, streaming sync and, and sort of exploitation of the masters, or in the case of the first one we did, we actually bought them out and repatriated between. So there was an exit event. Oh, okay, um, cool. Yeah, so uh, I have to be careful because that's it's that was kind of just treading a very fine line with the inland revenue in the UK that you know we were managing that we shouldn't really be the buyers of the farm, but anyway, we got gotcha. away with that one. But okay. <laughs> I mean, the crazy thing is, so when we the first one, as I said, we did it, started it four years ago, it's only recently matured. Mm -hmm. Um, but now, you know, the value of, I mean, I hate talking about music in terms of value of IP, but it is where the, you know, it's the common language now. Sure. The value of music IP has just exploded. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you've got companies now like Hypnosis who are just, you know, running riots through the market, buying up every catalog and buying songwriter rights. And, you know, and there's a ton of them there. It's not just hypnosis. There, oh yeah, dozens. there's royalty exchange, there's sound royalties. I, I have the CEO of the Music Fund yeah. on, similar. So there's all of these companies that are investing uh, or, or working with investors or have basically set up as marketplaces almost sometimes yes. where you can invest in, in, you know, various rights, whether it's master or publishing. And sometimes the artists are involved. Sometimes it's the label, sometimes it's totally direct to the independent artist and it's, uh, on just their back streaming revenue and it's a yeah, percentage it's, of it, that. It, yeah, it's a short-term loan. It's funny, I mean, right. you know, hypnosis, I hope I don't know if you're familiar with hypnosis, but it's kind of an interesting, mm -hmm. you know, they raised a billion dollars in two years. Wow. Uh, and invested it wow. all in, uh, and you know, and they are riding that kind of wave of streaming growth and they're putting a team around it to really start working to properly exploit the catalog. But you know, mm -hmm. they're a fund. So huh. people have invested vast amounts of money. They kind of, the fund owns the rights to the, uh, to the repertoire. And, you know, they're expecting to deliver, I don't know, six, 7% return on that investment. Which is, okay. you know, fine. Sure. You know, where we, <laughs> I, I've had to ask this question is, we do it the other way around, but at the much smaller level is that, you know, we're not going out and spending a 16 to 20 times net publishing share multiple to acquire a catalog. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that, pension funds do that kind of thing. What we're doing is saying, listen, you know, we are taking an educated managed risk in these group of artists because we totally believe in what they're doing. But also the benefit is the value of copyrights is growing. So, you know, the risk of the maximum risk is that mm -hmm. uh, if it all goes horribly wrong, but we believe it could go incredibly well. And guess what? You know, your multiple will be vastly bigger than mm -hmm. Buying an established, you know, you buy an established catalog, it's not suddenly going to explode. It's going to, it's going to sure. carry on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now on the other side of the equation, on the artist side, um, what can the artist expect from these deals in terms of are you providing? Uh, are you looking at it like an advance, like a, a, a label style advance deal? Um, and then how long are you say the, the term is kind of like an album and it's mutual, you mutually can agree to for the option, a, you, yeah. you know, move forward and that kind of thing. Um, 
Uh, yeah, how how is that how is that working with the advance? Is it more of a, a, a investment this kind of style, or are you deducting marketing expenses, or like how does that work? Well, it's, it's actually is a hybrid. So we we guarantee to invest a minimum of X to exploit it. Now, and part of that minimum will be a personal advance, but it's based on the number of masters we acquire. Okay, the number of copyrights. So we say okay. You know, personal advice, we write a check for that, and then we're prepared. So, but whatever you want to take out of that fund, that will lose that will limit the amount we can invest. So, uh, you know, as I said, we make a minimum guarantee. You can absolutely take a personal advance out of that minimum guarantee. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, you know, to be absolutely honest, Aaron, we've already spent more than the minimum guarantee anyway. It just <laughs> happens that way. Right. That's the right. way it is. Um, so you know, the idea is Again, as I said, the initial idea is, is that, look, you know, if we do the job that, that I think we can do and we can help you is, you know, we can put you in a position where if you choose to go to a major, you're in a much better position to negotiate a much more favorable term and have control sure. of your rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you choose to do that, you walk away, that's fine. You know, and we're very happy because I think the value of the copyrights that we will retain will continue to grow. Mm-hmm. If you like the flexibility in the way that we work, you like that freedom, then we'll continue like we do with Ali. Then we'll develop that relationship into a more longer term, but a very similar type of mutual structure. So for instance, we will be a partner on recorded music, but have a small share in live. You know, we were, in certain circumstances, you know, quite a few artists he had had no management. You know, so they'd want to manage, but you end up doing it anyway. Right. Um, but primarily is, is, you know, I'm very conscious that, yes, we can scale. and There's a lot of desire to scale, but I also don't want it to be a point where you stop providing the level of service that you provide. I mean, totally. You know, and also, again, I've reached that point in my life where I just want to be work with people I enjoy working with. That's great. To that's great. <laughs> well, that's that's actually a great uh, great place to to end. I I have one final question uh, that I ask everybody who comes on the show. Uh, what does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? It depends if you talk as an artist. As an artist, every artist I've ever come across. In fact, I've, I, I've never signed an artist who said I want to be a star. I virtually every artist just wants to say, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to make music and support myself and pay my rent. And da, da, da. That's making it in the new music business, is my view. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if you, it's that old, you know, internet adage, but it's a thousand true fans. I think it's probably 10,000 true fans, but sure. you know what? 10,000 true fans that you were with, you've got a good job. You've got a good living. Right on. Well, Nick, thank you so much for for being on the show. This is a really fascinating conversation, and I'm really excited to see uh, how Twin evolves and develops, and uh, you are really innovating in the new music business, and I appreciate seeing that. So, Pleasure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, well, thank thank you. for having me. All right, absolutely. All right. Have a good night. See ya. Thanks, Eric. Bye-bye.